All right, welcome back to part two of the water soluble vitamins. Uh, we're going to start with folate uh, and go through until the end of all the water soluble vitamins. Um, so let's get started. Uh, folate uh, has a couple of different names um, that mean slightly different things. Folic acid is the synthetic source of folate. So by synthetic, I mean not found uh, naturally in food sources of folate, but the form of folate that they use when they make vitamin supplements or when they fortify foods with folate. Uh, folic acid is, um, the chemical structure actually makes it um, easier for the body to absorb. We actually absorb it 1.7 times more efficiently than the folate found naturally in foods. Uh, so natural sources of folate include liver, again with those legumes, and leafy green vegetables. Uh, we actually, because of our, our diet that doesn't typically include a lot of liver legumes and unfortunately <laughs> leafy green vegetables, um, a lot of people weren't getting enough folate. Uh, so in the late 90s, they actually started fortifying grains with folate. So remember, we enrich grains with thiamine, niacin, riboflavin, meaning that when we process grains, we take them out and then we put them back in. Uh, folate is similar to that in that we add folate to grains. They're not normally found there, um, but they've been fortified. So, so all of our bread and pasta and things like that um, now have folic acid added to it. In terms of our needs and upper level of safety, uh, you can see those here because we have different um, bioavailabilities, different ways we absorb it. We have this one common unit, similar to what we've seen with, with some of our other vitamins. Uh, so a dietary folate equivalent can be used. Uh, in terms of UL, there is a risk of toxicity. Uh, in this case, folate and B12 work very closely together in the human body and they're involved in each other's metabolism. Um, so one of the things that can happen is if you have really high folic acid intake, uh, and this is going to be only with the synthetic folic acid, not with the natural food folates, uh, it may mask a B12 deficiency. So someone might be deficient in B12 and they would do a blood test and it would be difficult to, um, you might not be able to tell that the person has a B12 deficiency if they have too much um, folic acid uh, folate um, in their body as well. So here's where we're getting folate in our diet. You can see that it's from um, beans and lentils. Those would be those legume family. Um, orange juice is a really good natural source. All of those wonderful green things like peas and spinach and asparagus and edamame. Um, and then those orange sources at the end, those are the grains that are now fortified in, in folic acid. So since we started doing that, um, we actually have pretty good folate status in this country because it's in uh, quite a bit of foods. Uh, we absorb folate fairly easily. We have pass passive diffusion. It gets transported to the liver and it can travel around in our blood or our bile. Uh, we can excrete folate pretty easily in both our urine and our feces. Um, it has um, a couple of functions. These ones are very important. Uh, like our other B vitamins, it's a coenzyme. Uh, its coenzyme form is, is in a form called tetrahydrofolic acid or THFA. Um, and you can see down there uh, a chemical reaction that requires the, the folate as a coenzyme. Um, before we've been talking a lot about these coenzymes for energy metabolism, folate's different. We actually use folate for DNA synthesis. Uh, so you can imagine that that's a, a pretty important function um, for DNA. If you have a folate deficiency, it's um, diagnosable from a blood test. Uh, so if you look here, um, this would be a, a stem cell, a precursor, a baby red blood cell. Um, and if you have good folate and B12 status, um, because they're involved in that DNA synthesis, 
um, that would be happening here in the nucleus, we can have normal um, cellular function. So the, the cell could divide and, and start to peripherate, and that would be very normal. And then you'd have these nice mature red blood cells that look exactly how um, they're supposed to. Um, if you have poor folator B12 deficiency, it's kind of weird is, you know, the DNA is going to get impacted. So remember that's happening in the nucleus of the cell. Um, and if, if that's happening, the cells are unable to divide, oops, sorry about that, and the nucleus starts to get bigger and bigger and bigger because you have all of these, um, these cells where the, the process has started um, to divide and make new cells, but it wasn't able to finish because it wasn't a, enough folate or B12. So megaloblastic anemia, so think about mega is big, you have these huge cells because the nucleus gets um, larger and larger with these, um, because the cells are unable to divide due to the deficiency. Um, well, it's been linked to um, cancer. You know, anything about cancer, um, you know, cancer are cells that divide rapidly, but they're disease cells, cells that have a, a mutation in them. Um, so, so folate has been linked um, to some types of cancer. Uh, we know that, that it's important for sort of DNA stability, so maybe help preventing in some regards. Um, and then some concern if you already have cancer that, that you might be feeding that cancer growth if, if you have excessive um, folate. So there's no uh, official name for a, a folate deficiency, but one of the most well-known consequences of a folate deficiency is a neural tube defect. Um, so this would happen um, to a fetus while a woman is pregnant um, because you need that folate for that normal DNA replication. Um, if that process is impacted, especially in the nervous system, you can get something called spina bifida. Um, which is a common neural tube defect. You can see that the spinal cord wasn't fully um, closed here and, and you have this um, large lesion um, that would be a type of neural tube defect. Uh, and we know that, that women who are planning a pregnancy and are pregnant definitely need to be sure they're getting good folate in their diet uh, and supplementing with folate in order to prevent these uh, in fact, in the United States, that's the primary reason why we started fortifying with folic acid um, was to make sure that, that pregnant women were getting a, enough folic acid um, while they were pregnant to prevent these. So the next uh, B vitamin is B12. If you're sort of counting along and thinking, well, why did we skip a bunch of B vitamin? Um, that's because folate um, has multiple different forms. Um, but if we get up to 12, we now have a whole new type of vitamin in this category like B6. It's very obvious that it's a B vitamin. Uh, B12 is a really interesting vitamin though. Um, we almost always think of vitamins as in fruits and vegetables, but the best source of B12 is animal products. So we get it from meat and fish. Um, most of us get, a lot of us get um, enough B12, but there's a couple of groups that are more prone to deficiencies. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, B12 is not thought to be toxic in any way. There is no upper limit of safety for it. Um, in terms of absorption, this is actually one of the reasons why some groups have B12 deficiency. It's, it's one of the harder um, vitamins to absorb and, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that it's sort of bound up in the protein because it's coming from animal foods. Uh, so in order for B12 to be properly absorbed, that process is going to start in the stomach. Um, so if you've got B12, let's say you were eating fish, that was a good source of B12. Um, the body kind of has to release that B12 from the food and hydrochloric acid in the stomach does a good job of, of kind of breaking free that B12. Um, the vitamin, the free vitamin, actually now gets bound to a special carrier, um, an R protein, as it moves into the small intestine. Uh, now we have to have lipase, so a, an enzyme from the pancreas that would normally think of as breaking up fats, 
uh, is going to free the B12 up again. So now it's not going to be bound to the R protein. And now the free, vit B, the free vitamin B12 is able to bind with something called intrinsic factor. Uh, and in fact, you do need that intrinsic factor to properly absorb B12. Um, B12 bound to that intrinsic factor does travel to the liver. Um, you can actually store B12 for quite a few years in your liver. So here's our best sources. Um, again, you're going to see this mostly in animal products, um, liver, we store it in our liver, so do animals. Um, oysters are a great source, clams, um, we can get B12 from dairy products, um, from some soy products, and it's fortified in some cereals. It's not required to be fortified or enriched like some of the others, uh, but it often is anyway. So not surprisingly, a B vitamin is important for enzymatic reactions. Um, you've probably kind of gathered this when we were talking about folate, uh, but you need B12 to make the coenzyme form of folate, THFA, um, and that is again involved in DNA, nucleic acid synthesis. Um, you also use B12 when you're forming something called methionine um, from something um, called homocysteine. Uh, you need that, that B12 to metabolize homocysteine and make methyl groups, which are very important for sort of DNA stabilization. Um, so these are very simplistic um, um, pictures talking about some of the chemical reactions that B12 is involved in. Um, so that's why you've got B12 right here. This is again that tetrahydrofolic acid. Um, so part of the metabolism of, of folate, which is why B12 and folate are so closely linked. Um, and here's the homocysteine methionine cycle that B12 is involved in. Um, so homocysteine is actually toxic. You want it to be able to metabolize to methionine so it doesn't build up. Um, and that's creating these methyl groups, um, which are um, form a variety of functions in the human body. If you have a B12 deficiency, um, you can develop something called pernicious anemia. Um, that is actually what I showed you earlier with folate where you had those large red blood cells, uh, macrocytic megaloblastic, so big, big blood cells um, resulting in the, the same reason we talked about with folate, but if it's due to B12, it's, it's considered pernicious anemia. Um, you also have neurological changes, um, so this is, is very dangerous. Um, it can cause um, nerve damage and memory loss. Uh, you can build up homocysteine, which as I said is, is um, toxic in high amounts if it builds up, and it's also uh, been shown to be a marker for, for heart disease. Um, we tend to consume a lot, but people who don't consume a lot are people who may have trouble um, digesting and absorbing B12 can develop a deficiency. So atropic gastritis, uh, which is actually very common in elderly, that's why I showed an elderly couple on the beach here. This is um, a group that has to be more careful about their B12 uh, because we tend to have um, some inflammation in the lining of the stomach as we age. We also tend to have less acidity. Um, it's much harder for an older person sometimes to absorb B12, um, and that can result in a deficiency. Uh, because we get B12 from animal products, people who don't eat animal products, like strict vegetarians, um, have to be careful about their B12 as well. Uh, so in terms of, of treatment, we have to be a little bit more creative um, with our B12, especially if the problem's due to not being able to absorb it, right? You can consume all the B12 that you want, but if you can't absorb it, um, it's not going to get into the bloodstream and be able to do all of its important functions. Um, that's why you can get injections of B12, so you can put it directly into the bloodstream and bypass absorption. Um, you can also get B12 through a nasal gel, so think of it like inhaling it. Um, and you can also just take really, really high doses of B12 
um, and have, when it's at real high doses, you'll absorb it via passive diffusion, so sort of enough to overcome um, a problem due to um, absorption with the stomach acid or the intrinsic factor. So just a little knowledge check here as we move along, who would be at most risk for a B vitamin B12 deficiency? So your choice, someone on the Adkins diet, and if you don't know what that is, it's a generally a high protein diet. Uh, someone who never eats fruits and vegetables, um, someone who takes large doses of antacids, or someone who takes folic acid um, supplements. Um, so it's definitely, wouldn't be this as the best answer because if you're eating a lot of protein, you're getting a lot of B12. Um, not eating fruits and vegetables is not good, but it's not going to impact your B12 status. Um, antacids actually is a problem because that's going to lower your stomach acid. So this one um, would be a risk factor for a B12 deficiency. Um, this one, it might have raised a red flag for you because remember high folic acid can mask a B12 deficiency. Um, it wouldn't cause the B12 deficiency, would it be, would make it harder to diagnose. So moving along from B12, the next water soluble vitamin we'll go over is choline. Um, this is found in foods in the form of lecithin. Uh, you might have remembered that when we talked about phospholipids. So lecithin is a, a phospholipid that is found in the food supply, uh, specifically in um, milk, liver, eggs, and peanuts. Um, choline is kind of interesting. Uh, we do have uh, adequate intake for it, um, but it can actually be synthesized by the body. Um, deficiency is, is relatively rare because it is in foods and we can synthesize it. Um, it does have a toxicity, and, and this is a, just an odd one, right? So if you've got you know, 3.5 grams, which is a huge amount. Remember the adequate intake is only 550 milligrams. This is 3.5 grams, so 3,500 milligrams. Um, you're, you'd have a strange scent. So your, your body um, would kind of give off a fishy smell with too much choline. Um, it would actually make your blood pressure potentially too low and cause vomiting and other uh, gastrointestinal upset. So here's the, again, the food sources. Um, eggs are a really good source. You can also get it in meat and fish, um, dairy products, and a little bit in fruits and vegetables. So we absorb choline in the small intestine, and then like we've been saying for most of these, it goes to the liver, transports or moves around the body in our blood. Uh, we can store choline very well in actually all of our tissues. Um, we can excrete it in our urine. We can also convert it to something else called betaine and make it into methyl groups. Um, it functions. Um, it's part of phospholipids, lipoprotein cell membranes, and is a precursor to something called acetylcholine, which is a neurotransmitter. Uh, I'm showing here, this is um, baby food. Um, it's a rice cereal. It's one of the first foods that we sometimes give infants in this country. And you'll notice they've added a couple things to it, and one of those is choline. Um, so because of its role um, with acetylcholine, which is, again, a neurotransmitter, um, there's interest in choline as being good for, for brain health, especially developing brains, um, as we would see in an infant. Uh, we're getting here towards the end, so we now have our first non-B vitamin. So after B, of course, comes C. Uh, vitamin C is a pretty famous vitamin. Um, it is, again, a, a water-soluble vitamin, which is why it's in this group. Uh, most people know we find it in citrus fruits, so all of our oranges and lemon and lime, kiwi is a great source of vitamin C. Um, all of the peppers, if you like red and green peppers, and all of our green vegetables are good sources of vitamin C. So this is definitely one uh, from fruits and vegetables. Uh, in terms of needs, it's kind of an interesting one. Uh, we actually have an additional need for people who smoke. 
Um, the reason for that is because vitamin C is a very important antioxidant and smokers have more oxidative stress than non-smokers. So the extra vitamin C is, is important for their health. Um, there is a UL, um, somebody just asked me about this the other day because they were taking um, two grams of vitamin C every single day because they were hoping to strengthen their immune system uh, and not get sick. Um, and I warned them that they would probably start to get some stomach issues from having that every single day, probably notice some diarrhea. Um, and there's really no evidence that, that having big, big doses on a daily basis is good for you. In fact, it's, it's probably going to upset your stomach. Um, vitamin C adapts very well to intake in terms of absorption. Um, so if you um, eat a lot of it or you're taking big supplements and you have a lot of vitamin C in your diet, you actually don't absorb it very well. Um, your body has everything it needs and you end up um, excreting it in your urine. Um, we can store vitamin C a little bit. We can store it in our glands, our white blood cells, our eyes, and our brain. Uh, and again, any excess that the body doesn't need gets excreted in your urine. Here's our sources. Um, so think about all these beautiful, bright colored fruits and vegetables, all different colors, including kind of the traditional green that we think of. Um, so if you eat fruits and vegetables, um, you're gonna be pretty good with your vitamin C. Um, I'll just point out here that guava and kiwi are the best sources. Everybody always thinks it's um, oranges and thinks they should have orange juice. Uh, certainly orange juice is a good source, but um, we can get it from a lot of different things. Um, the other good one I mentioned earlier are red peppers. Vitamin C has, I would say, somewhat famous um, functions. When we talk about scurvy in a second with the deficiency, it's going to tie back into some of these functions. Um, so if you remember talking about collagen, we actually talked about collagen when we went over protein. Um, so collagen is that really important kind of rope-like connector that's found all over the human body. Um, and we need vitamin C to help our collagen. It actually helps um, hydroxylate, so form some of these bonds that, that make the collagen be able to, to do its job and build these strong connective tissues. Um, if we don't have vitamin C, you can see they're not binding together and we're not gonna be able to have um, sort of those strong, robust, um, connective tissue to form collagen. Um, just to really quickly, um, we have um, this in our gums. Um, so one of the reasons why we want good vitamin C is to form that strong um, collagen and connective tissue in our gums. That's actually gonna help hold our teeth in our mouths. So other functions of vitamin C, um, we need vitamin C to make amino acids, hormones, carnitine, and neurotransmitters. Uh, we know vitamin C is a really good antioxidant, so protecting um, specifically our eyes from damage. If you think about our eyes taking in all of that light from the sun and um, all day long and um, how damaging, you know, the sun gives out those UV rays and um, in order to keep our eyes healthy, we want to have good vitamin e C status. Um, also been linked to um, being protective against cancer. Um, thought being that more oxidative stress can cause the types of mutations that can eventually lead to cancer. Uh, we know that vitamin C helps us absorb iron. This is especially important for people who might have iron deficiency anemia. We'll get to that when we talk to about minerals. Uh, and of course, the famous function of, of being important for our immune function, we know we store it in white blood cells. Um, so there's a lot of interest in um, boosting our immune system, especially if we think we're getting a cold or the flu and, and making sure we have good vitamin C status. Uh, the deficiency disease of um, vitamin C is called scurvy. Most of you will envision a pirate when I say that. Uh, in fact, scurvy was, was first sort of discovered and characterized in sailors. So if you think about being on a, a boat out at the sea for long periods of time, the type of food they would have had, um, they had very little fresh produce. So they were not getting vitamin C, um, and that's when they were having problems um, with collagen synthesis when, when their teeth would start to fall out. 
Uh, we also have linked vitamin C to increased risk of cancer and heart disease, mostly because of its role as an antioxidant um, and you know, lowering our immune system and being more prone to things like colds without good vitamin C. So here is an awesome table. There should be some version of this in your textbook, even if you have an older or newer version, um, but a nice listing, right? We have all of these B vitamins and vitamin C that we talked about. You have to know the major functions. You have to know what happens in a deficiency. Um, you have to know um, who's at risk for a deficiency. Um, you have to know all the dietary sources for these. You do not have to know the RDA. Um, you do have to know if they are toxic. So a lot of good information in, in these two slides. Um, so that is it. We did a, a good job hopefully paying attention and taking notes. Um, I will warn you that um, these tests can be hard because again, the B vitamins all start to run together for students. So make sure that you have really good notes.